Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Martin Saggers. How's things going, Martin? Yeah, very good, thanks. Very good. Getting through this winter. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a tough one for all. So let's uh, start where it all began for yourself. You're born in Norfolk. Tell us how you first got into the cricket. Um, well, it all started at school, really. Um, I, I was I was at school through the era of, uh, of, of a lot of teacher strikes and uh, teachers deciding they're not going to do extracurricular activities, you know, run the sports teams and everything. So I naturally played every sport at, uh, at school, mainly football. Um, and I played a lot at the weekends. But then I got to a, um, the age of 16 and there was an advert in the local paper because I, I, I loved cricket. Um, but I, I hadn't ever played any uh, any cricket at all. So there was an advert basically asking for cricketers to, to come along to the nets on the Thursday. So I went along, um, six o'clock in the evening, joined them at the nets, and uh, I said, oh, uh, can I help you? I'll c- come here for the nets to trial out for the team. I said, how old are you? 16. Well, we're, we're, we're looking for people probably in their 20s so that they could come and play for the second team or, or maybe even the first team. But stick around, you know, have, have a bit of fun and uh, we'll put you in touch with the under-16s. So I thought, right, I'll just just have a little bowl. And uh, about 20 minutes later, the guy came back to me and he said, uh, uh, sorry to bother you, but what are you doing Saturday? We could do with you in our second team. So it, it went from there, really. And uh, that was literally for Kings Lynn playing village cricket. And I, I just I just loved playing cricket and just wanted to get out there and play, play in a team. And then your path into minor counties cricket, I mean, you represented Norfolk. And again, do you think that's a good grounding for 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 any professional, like up and coming professional as well? Minor counties. Yeah, cricket? I think I think you know you you do have to learn your your trade, um, and there's no better way than playing, you know, in those levels and working your way up. I mean, as I say, Kingsland was village cricket, so I played a couple of years there just because I wanted to play cricket. And, you know, I was, I was quite um, petite. I was quite small when I was young. So I didn't have the pace or the strength to really bowl fast. And as I say, I, I was just playing purely because I wanted to play cricket and out of enjoyment. Then I went to university. And uh, the first thing I did was sign up for, a, um, uh, for the cricket team there. And I played in the, the university side. And when I was at the Nets, uh, one of the guys sort of said, have you ever thought about playing professionally? I said, well, no, why? Is it, is it worth it? Because c- coming from Norfolk, I hadn't seen any first-class cricket or anything. So um, I, I basically played university cricket. I joined Halifax in the Yorkshire League, played three years there while I was at university. So I, I, I got my degree. Uh, and during that time, I was trialling here, there and everywhere at uh, various counties, but not quite making the grade. Um, Essex was one of them, Leicestershire, North Hants. Um, and then I finally got... Um, got to be picked. I played for Norfolk, as I say, but I got picked for the full minor county side in the Benson Hedges Cup in 1996. And we played a round-robin tournament against uh, Warwickshire, Leicestershire. Um, who else was in it? Uh, obviously Durham, because that's where Durham kind of spotted me and played a number of second team games for Durham um, after that Benson Hedges series. And um, subsequently got, got a contract um, in the July of that year, 1996. But I would, I would certainly say that the, the, the best way to learn is to play the game and to play at all levels as well. You know, you've got to push yourself as much as you can. And then even if you think you're not quite ready, just, just try and push yourself to that next level. And obviously, as you being a bowler, are you of the belief that you need to get those overs under your belt as a youngster? You just got to keep bowling? Are you of that mindset? You have. I, I, I'm definitely of more of a mindset of you have to bowl rather than go to the gym. Um, what you don't want to do is bulk up. If you do go to the gym, it's it's more for toning and just getting yourself right for bowling. So that that would include perhaps a lot of Pilates, um, light weights, um, repetitions, that sort of thing. Um, but back in my day, I, it was just bowling and bowling. But, but one thing to really be careful of is stress fractures in the back, because between the ages of 15 um, to sort of 17, 18, your body grows so much. And if there's any slight um, issue with a back problem, I would suggest that you just stop bowling totally, which in fact is what happened 
to my son. I mean, he's he's grown from sort of five foot six, seven to six foot two within the space of a year. And he's not bowling at the moment because he's grown so quickly. He's got a back problem and you've got to be be careful. Rather take a year out of cricket and let that back get right or, or strengthen it, as I say, rather than ruin it. Because um, I have seen people in the past try and bowl through it. They've been pushed and pushed. And by the time they're 20, they actually can't bowl anymore because their back's too far um, gone. How do you sum up your time uh, up in Durham? So you then was it ninety six to ninety eight was it? How do you? Yeah, it? Um, yeah. Um, released. I think it was ninety ninety eight or yeah ninety eight. Yeah, September ninety eight. Um, I think what happened. I kind of once I got my contract, which I'd been working so hard for, I kind of took my foot off the pedal and thought, right, you know, I've I've got my contract. So that's what I've always been working for, and then I kind of you know perhaps didn't work hard enough once I got there. So not, I didn't take it for granted. I, I just needed to work a little bit harder. My body wasn't used to the bowling day in, day out that you need in county cricket. Hence, I got a lot of injuries. Um, I, um, you know, just, just the, the, the usual, the hamstrings, the, the quads, the groins, the, things like that, that you can avoid if you, you know, do a bit more fitness. So that was, that was one of my you know, bad points that I didn't do enough fitness and strengthening when I was young. Um, so I had two and a half years there. I did all right when I played, um, but I just didn't play enough. And so obviously they they, they released me uh, in that year. I know you mentioned that you said your body wasn't used to bowling in, in county cricket, the volume. But do you think actually too much cricket was being played back then as well? Less kind of management of players? Do you have any views on that? Um, well, I think I think it was, you know, they had the set 11 and they pretty much used that 11 unless they were injured. There wasn't that squad rotation that they have now. Um, yes, the, 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 they look further into how much a bowler has been bowling, you know, how old they are, how much they need to be bowling or should be bowling. So they don't over, you know, overwork them. Um, because if you do, um, you are going to get injuries. Then you moved to Kent. How did that all come about? Well, it was, it was quite funny. In that I was literally playing... Um, a second team game for Durham and Jeff Cook came down, spoke to me, took me around, you know, the, the death walk around the pitch, you know, arm around the shoulder. Sorry to say that you, you're being released. Um, you can stick around if you want um, for, till the end of the season or you're, you know, we're happy for you to leave and go home. And I said, no, I'll, I'll see the season out because I was thinking this could be my last, you know, it, part of playing first class cricket or being involved in a first class cricket side so I, I stuck around and you know obviously went back up to Durham and there was still another month left of the season I think or three weeks and subsequently they um, actually oh, sorry going back on that same game I was bowling in the middle and I was bowling quite well and the umpire um, was Mark Benson um, formerly of Kent and uh, he said, oh, he's, you know, you're bowling quite well, you know, why aren't you in the first team? I said, oh, I've just been told I'm being released. And he goes, really? So he, he said, give me your number, which I did, and I'll pass it on to Kent and see if they might be interested. So having stuck around with Durham for the last two or three weeks of the, of the season, um, there was some injuries for Durham, and I ended up playing the last two first-class games. Um, so I thought, right, I've got a second chance here, you know, and... I'd been in contact with Kent at the time and told him that I was playing. And one of the games was at Worcestershire, last game of the season. And Kent uh, was, the, the coach at the time was John Wright. And they were playing Warwickshire in Birmingham. So on one of the days when I was bowling, he actually came down to watch. And I kind of, every time I was running into bowl, I was sort of looking over my shoulder because I could just feel him. John Wright was up in the stands watching. So I, I knew I had to perform to bowl well. It was, it was a second chance. And I did, did bowl quite well during that game. Um, I got three wickets in each innings. Um, and nothing happened straight away. It wasn't until the following summer when um, I, uh, I got a phone call on May the 1st, sort of asking me to, to come along to Kent. They wanted to sign me for the rest of the summer to give me a, give me a chance. So it was a second chance. And you know, I certainly didn't make the same mistake by not, not working and training hard, hard enough. And, you know, I, I took it with open arms. 
he certainly grabbed it. Would it be fair to say that the golden period was between 2000 and 2003? I read up some stats. Yeah. Got, was it 50 first class wickets in, in each of those years? Was it 82 wickets in 2002? I hope those stats yeah, are correct. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. What I kind of click was, for you then? Sorry? What click for you during that period? I don't know, really. I think, you know, I did work hard. Um, I, I used to go away in the winters to South Africa to, to play for a team called Ramberg in Johannesburg. And I think it, it, when I was at Durham, I went away, yes, and I bowled at the weekends. But um, I perhaps just, that, that's pretty much all. I trained a little bit, but not enough. So when I had that second chance with Ken, I, I worked harder when I went away to South Africa. And I think the conditions at Kent suited me and, you know, it all, the ball always swung there. Um, and with the slope as well, you always got that nip down the hill because I used to bowl from the pavilion end. And it just suited my style of bowling. Um, and I, I don't know, as you say, it, it just clicked. And I suppose when you're getting wickets as well, you just feel better mentally. So it, it's, it's, it's just a, a continuation of, you know, you do well, you feel good, you, you bowl better. And it just carries on that way. And I think for four years, as you say, you know, I, I, I was very fortunate to, to keep the, the, the injuries away and to stay fit throughout those four years. And, yeah, wickets just kept coming. So prior to you actually getting the, the England call-up, did you actually have any conversations prior to that? I think, were you, age 30? I was 31, yeah, when I 30, made my 31? debut. Yeah, so did you have any conversations prior to that? It was obviously you were getting the wickets in first-class county cricket. I know David Fulton was a big uh, pusher of your case as well. Did the selectors have any any uh, conversations with you or was it literally just well, they, you left to your own devices, they, get the wickets, etc.? They did, yeah. I mean, David Graveney and um, Jeff Miller were sort of selectors at the time throughout that sort of period. Um and I think the uh, the chairman of Kent, Carl Openshaw, was very open, and he also wrote letters, and he was sort of supporting my case. I personally was more of a sort of just just get on with it, and you know if it's to be, it's to be, because I don't want to be one of those people knocking on the door every five minutes saying, you know, why aren't I being picked? Why aren't I being picked? Because there's a reason why they haven't picked you, and you've got to respect that, you know. So as long as you keep working and persevering, you know you you will get that opportunity hopefully i do remember at leicester um we we were we were bowling and i think i got five or six wickets and jeff miller was watching and i thought well I, you know what more can i do sort of thing but his i think he he, he said afterwards you know oh, the conditions were you know in your favor and he, he was almost trying to make make a, a a case for not picking me as it were so in a way, that spurred me on a little bit more. So, right, OK, I'll, I'll still prove to you that I can get wickets. So it's, it's just trying to prove people wrong, I think, and, and, you know, just keep getting the wickets. And then you were put on it's the standby list for the Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Then eventually, due to Andrew Flintoff's injury, you get the call in Bangladesh. What did it mean to you to get, to get the test cap? Yeah, well, I was a bit surprised it was Andrew Flintoff I was replacing because my batting average isn't great. So I can't, can't even though it was Flintoff, I, I couldn't class myself as an all-rounder. Um, I was I was in South Africa at the time when I got the call. And I literally just landed on the Friday, played cricket on the Saturday and the Sunday. And then on the Monday morning, I got a phone call saying, asking if I was available, you know, what's my availability? Um, we, we're, we're considering you for the tour to Bangladesh it's between two, you and one other what's your availability and obviously naturally I said yes I'm available and 20 minutes later phoned me back and said yes we want you to, to join the team and this was on the uh, Monday they were like, flying out on the Wednesday so I I, I couldn't um, did I, yeah, I I flew back that, that night on the Monday um, got back on the Tuesday sorry they were flying out on the Tuesday so saw them at the airport on the Tuesday I then had a night at home um, before I flew out with Richard Johnson, who just got married at the time. So we flew out together on the Wednesday. So it was a bit of a, you know, a long, long haul flights here, there and everywhere. But um, just to get that call up initially was, you know, it's what you work for, what you strive for. But um, I knew I wasn't first choice or second choice, third choice even um, to be selected. So I, I wasn't expecting to play. I, it was just great to be involved 
in an England setup on a on a, a an overseas tour. When you uh, did, uh, who actually presented you with your cap? And do you remember the words that were said to you? Um, I'm, I, I, I'm not entirely. I can't remember exactly who who presented the cap to me, um, but certainly I remember um, Michael Vaughan um, sort of saying, you know congratulations you know you've you've worked hard for this and you know just relax and enjoy it and you know do what you've been doing all the time um over in the county setup you know it's it's no different really you know in a way you you still got to bowl the ball in the same same areas you know try and cut out the the fact that you are playing test cricket um but you know it's when when you do find out that you you're playing um it harmison had to go home uh, he had a back injury and they decided to play an extra seamer instead of two spinners. So I was very fortunate. And in, in terms of the selection and the pitch we played on, which wasn't a turning pitch, actually had a bit of um, pace in it um, for Bangladesh, which is quite rare at Chittagong. So, I, I, you know, obviously to be given the cap, um, great honour, great feeling to be one of those, you know, few players that have represented their country. Did you notice... The, the difference in terms of the highest level to, to county and if you could maybe if you did like it was can you go a bit deeper was it just kind of the elite mindset the training or or general just just general environment can you go a bit deeper um, with that? certainly certainly there's a lot more training I mean when you're on an overseas tour you, you literally you know you're doing something every day nets training you know fielding practicing everything involved um so in the county circuit, you know, you do play the game, you go home or you go back to the hotel sort of thing. So it's, it, it is totally different. And uh, when you are away, you're, you know, you're building up for that one test match rather than a county game, day off, travel, another county game. You know, you haven't got time to train as much because, to be honest, when you're, when you're bowling so much, you, you actually don't need to train because you are exerting a lot of energy anyway. So you are staying fit by bowling. Um, but, but yeah, you, you know, you've got the, the backroom staff that are always there to, to, to support you as well. And obviously, you know, there's more with the England setup than there is in the county circuit with a, with a county setup. And then back home, the test match against so New Zealand, you got a wicket. New Zealand, yeah. The first ball that you bowled in, uh, at home uh, for England. Yes, How was that indeed, as, a, yeah. as a moment <laughs> in your career? Well, I mean, again, I mean, after the Bangladesh tour, you know, I played the one test. I got a couple of wickets, didn't, you know, didn't, didn't break the walls down, as it were. Um, I just, I, I did speak to Duncan Fletcher and um, Michael Vaughan at the end of the tour and said, is there anything I need to do? You know, what do I need to do to, to improve my cricket? Um, so I went off, started the county season well again. And I had no inkling that I was anywhere near being selected again. And I was actually at uh, a golf day, Min Patel's benefit year, I was at a golf day. And I left my phone in the car, because then you couldn't have golf, um, phones on the courses. So I got back to my car and I had about 27 missed calls from David Graveney, basically saying, we need you to come up to Leeds to be on standby because Jimmy's got a, Jimmy Anderson's got a bad ankle. So I literally, um, I, I went up there the next day I wanted to go that night, but they said, no, just come up tomorrow because you probably won't play. And I thought, oh, great. OK, a trip up to Leeds, but I probably won't play. So I got up to Leeds and had a coffee with Grant Jones um, after they had their morning training. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, uh, you'll be playing tomorrow. And I thought, hang on. You know, I've, I was told I probably won't be playing, but yet you think I'll be playing? He said, yeah, Jimmy couldn't bowl today at all. So I was then almost, you know, thrown in at the deep end because I hadn't played um, for a few days, hadn't done any training or hadn't had any nets. So um, true enough, that evening at the team meeting, Duncan Fletcher said that I was playing, which obviously I was delighted. I'm not going to say, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not ready to play. Um, and then the next morning, overcast, typical Yorkshire Leeds, overcast, rainy, horrible day. Um, we did start on, uh, what time did we start? It started at 11 o'clock, I think. Uh, sorry, 12 o'clock. We started an hour late. Um, Hoggard and Harmison opened the bowling. And uh, I think after, you know, 40 minutes or so, they were 20, 30 for no wicket. And 
Vaughan East had Sags have a go, you know, a few, you know, about 20 minutes before lunch, um, handed me the ball. I remember running up the hill and I didn't, because at, at Headingley, there's quite a slope at both ends and I was running up the hill. I hadn't, you know, I didn't feel the rhythm because it was my first delivery. So, I, you know, I, I jumped into my bound and as I landed, it didn't feel quite right. Didn't land quite right, but I still managed to get the ball in a decent area, a bit fuller than I thought. Big drive from Richardson, and then uh, you know it swung back through the gate, little inside edge, and uh, I, I couldn't have asked for a dream start. So that was, yeah, it was a great moment, great feeling to get that first wicket. What was um, Michael Vaughan like as a captain and Duncan Fletcher as the head coach? It was obviously that team was building up to the famous 05 series and win against Australia. Did they stand out as as leaders? Did what made them special? Oh, very much so. Um, Michael Vaughan was very calm and composed, um, it, and Duncan Fletcher was was very much the same. You know, and they both they both worked very well together, and they got exactly what they wanted. Hence, you know, in two thousand and five, it was a very successful you know Ashes win. Um, they just said what they needed to say, and they don't. They almost let you get on with it because you're there because you've you know performed over the the years, and they know what you can do. So they don't need to teach you or coach you too much. They just need to you know they man manage you. Don't get me wrong. There, there's still a lot that they do, and it's and it's very positive in what they do, and they're very you know very good at what they do, and hence it was a successful period for England. And then back to yourself, you played for one further test match how do you reflect on your England career overall did you think you deserved to play more did you feel you got backed or were you just kind of grateful for the opportunities obviously anyone that represents their country is amazing in itself how, how would you look back at it I look back I'm very grateful that I got the chance to, to play and to play three tests um having come from village cricket at the age of even at 18 I was still playing village cricket Played no higher level than that. Um, to have come through the ranks, to, I, I, I do feel very fortunate to have represented England. Um, with regards to my performance, I wasn't happy with the three tests that I played. Um, I, I, I didn't quite find my rhythm in, um, certainly at Trent Bridge. At Headingley, I, I was very unlucky, actually. I, I remember um, bowling from the um, the new pavilion end, um, where the uh, the the university is now and I was coming down the hill and I, I just kept beating the edge beating the edge all the time and I think that that match I, I bowled better than I did in Trent Bridge Trent Bridge I just couldn't get any rhythm whatsoever um it was a lot um flatter the pitch a lot slower although I do remember I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it that um I had uh Stephen Fleming out LBW he was given not out um uh, and it was it was very disappointing because I, I was convinced that was out. Um, and, you know, yeah, things could have gone better. But as you say, you, you can't you, you can't take it away that it, it is such an honour. And back home in the domestic circuit, you had a loan spell with Essex as well. And then yeah. retirement comes in in 09. Talk us through the transition, the back end of your playing career. Um, well, Obviously, as a cricketer, you know, you're a long time retired. And, you know, most most cricketers do retire around between 35 and 40 if you have a nice, good, long career. And you've still got another 25 years or so of, of working life. So you have to be prepared for that. You know, fortunately, I, I had been to university and, and got my degree. Um, I studied architecture, but I didn't want to follow that route. I didn't want to. I'm, I'm not sure. I was so used to the, in, and the enjoyment of being in the cricket environment I wanted to stay in that but I saw that um whilst I was still playing I, I recognized that fact so uh, just one game I was playing probably back in 2004 or 5 um I was speaking to Jeremy Lloyds and um I think umpires are always looking out for future umpires and he said to me you know have you ever thought about umpiring and I thought well I kind of have but I haven't I, you know it would would appeal to me so I, I looked into it and um, I, I did a course that was run by the PCA. I've done fantastic things for, you know, professional cricketers. They really do look after them. And then subsequently took my um, my level one um, in 2004, five, I think it was. 
my level three I took in 2007. So I was, I was already, um, I'd, I'd passed the exams necessary to, to perhaps get on to the um, umpiring panel of um, reserve list umpires. And the, uh, um, the manager, Chris Kelly, he sort of, he, he knew that I was interested in doing it and was keen to pursue myself going into it. And he just said, once you've finished or decided you've finished your playing career, just let me know and we'll, you know, go down the right route. So for me, it was an easy transition. I think probably because I got injured in 2009, you know, you could, you could be, everybody wants to be a Darren Stevens that could carry on playing until he's about 60, 65. I mean, he's never going to retire from cricket, but the, the reality is, you know, it's, it's going to come to an end at some stage. I got injured and it was sort of right. That's it. I'm injured. I can't bowl anymore. So it, mentally I was sort of prepared to move on. And so it was an easy transition for me. It was right. Cricket playing side is done. Now I can fo focus on the umpiring side. And then talk us through the actual journey, your umpiring journey. You're just one below the elite panel. Am I correct to say? Is the, is the international yeah. umpires panel? That's so right. Talk through yeah. the differences and how you actually got to that level. And obviously, then is the end goal to then become one of the, the lead umpires on the elite panel? Is that your end goal? Well, I mean, it, it would be great to, um, you know, to, my, my goal would be to stand in a test match. You know, that's, that's, you've got to take little steps at a time. Um, it's, it's common knowledge that everybody wants to do the best they can at, at everything. But if you look too far ahead, you forget about those steps in the middle and how to get there in the first place. Um, I, I did two years on the reserve list to start with, and that's basically just toning your, your skills in your, um, your match skills when you go out to the middle it's not all about just standing there and giving people out not out there's so much more to umpiring you know the mental side of things and you know there's so much going on behind the scenes that people aren't aware of i think um and then after two years i was um promoted to the first class panel and and it's just a question of you know getting that, those games under your belt and getting those experiences learning from those experiences and those possible you know errors in judgment that you make um, because we're, we're never going to get everything right. And, the, you know, I did a few things in my early career that, you know, I perhaps could have done differently and I've learned from them and moved on. Um, and then like all careers, you know, in any form of life, you've, you've got to take those challenges and, you know, push yourself a, a little bit harder. Um, you then start getting those major matches, you know, and then you get the, the finals. So the Royal London final or the T20 finals days, and you've got to be able to cope with them and not let the pressure get to you. And then obviously I was fortunate enough to get promoted to the international panel this year. And so, you know, that's another goal that I've ticked off the list to, to do an international game, you know, a one day game or a T20. And it's, it's, it's a great experience. It's the best, well, I say seat in the house, but you're standing, but you know, it's, it's great to be out there and seeing some of these guys that they're unbelievable. Now you, how hard and how quick their hands are and how good their, their contact is with the ball. You just mentioned just there about this certain elements of umpiring that perhaps on the surface people don't realise and understand. Can you go a bit deeper into that? Is it, are we just talking more about the mental and the pressure side of things or was there other stuff that you were, you were thinking about? Well, there's just everything you've got. You've got, you know, overs in the day, the timings, you know, you've got a player that's gone off, um, off the field um, for an injury. So you, you've got to keep an eye on him and, that, you know, is he coming back? Is he, cause he's got eight minutes is he, if he's not back, you, you're always constantly writing notes and just to try and remind you of things. And, and it's not just a question of looking down the pitch, you, you know, when the ball's dead, you've got to be aware of what's going on around, you know, any player doing something that they shouldn't be. So you're constantly switched on all the time. Um, Do you think having played for England, i.e. the highest level, do you think you're more accustomed to the pressure or is it literally two different skills, two different elements to it? I think it, you, you understand the game. Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot and, you know, there are some great umpires out there that haven't played first-class cricket, um, but it, it does help to know the game and not just the laws of cricket, as it were. Um, it's, it's, it's all experience that, that you've been involved in and you just take that, 
into any form of the game that you can. Is how do you police the spirit of the game? Because there's, a, there's a, you know there's a lot being said recently in the Test match between Australia and in, 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 in India. A lot, a lot of talk behind the wicket from the Australian skipper Stephen Smith scratching away at Indian batsman's guard. So how are you as an umpire able to police that element of it? Um, I, I, it's down to man managing the players and it's almost like we were saying about understanding the game. You can see when things are just about to perhaps you know, peak and go over the, the, the boiling point of the players. You've almost got to step in there before it happens and you know, you've just got to be aware of what's going on so that you can, you know, be proactive instead of reactive after an event has already happened. But you're not going to see everything. It's, some things do happen very quickly. You know, there's been nothing going on throughout the whole match or the game. And then all of a sudden something just, just kicks off and you've got, there's nothing you can do about it apart from, you know, stop it from getting any worse. And is there, is there stuff that you do away from the field to improve your skills as an umpire, whether it be from the fitness side of things or the mental? Anything you do? Um, I, I like to get away from it, you know, and not think about it too much and just, just get away and detach myself a little bit from, uh, um, from the game. Um, needless to say, you all are always doing something. Um, I meet, I do a, a a third umpire simulation with uh, the ICC coach once a week. So you're always honing your skills with the third umpire. Um, Cause obviously if you're live to air and there's situations that happen that you, it's just training, you know, over that time. And then there's, we, we do get questions from the ICC that we, we answer each week. Um, and then they give us the answers, you know, just so that you, you're making sure that, that you understand the laws or the interpretations of the laws of all the playing conditions um, for that particular tournament. And then with technology, is that something that you also embrace coming into the game? I think you have to, yeah. It's like every 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 sport has got technology in it now. Um, and so if at the end of the day, we all want the right answer. And I, I, I've been in a position where I'm out on the field and I've, I've got the wrong decision. You know, I think second ball of the, uh, the Australian one-day game, um, Jason Roy, I gave him out, um, and it was just going over. Well, just going over. It was going over the top of the stumps. You know, you've you've almost got to deal with that feeling when you're out in the middle. But at least the, the players, it's the the, the right decision has event, eventually been been made um, because I had to overturn my decision. Um, but um, it's just one of those things. You know, there's no animosity towards you in a way because it's not affected them because there's you know Jason Roy was still in and he went on and I think he got a 50 I'm not I'm, and you know it, it's almost closure because the right decision has been made and then just to end on what's the most memorable game that you've been involved in as an umpire to date so far that's that's quite easy actually it was um Yorkshire versus Lancashire at Old Trafford and there was 20 odd thousand people and it was packed to the rafters um, T20 match and it was reduced to 14 overs and the first innings uh, Lancashire got 196 I think it was in 14 overs it was just you know I think Joss Butler went mad and there were sixes galore fours and sixes it was it was one of those pure pitches where you know it just came off the bat sweetly and um, everybody scored runs and then Yorkshire chasing it they uh, they actually needed four to win off the last ball, I think it was, or three to win off the last ball. Um, Joe Root and um, Kane Williamson were batting at the time. And so they fell short. Um, but, you know, 380 runs in, in 28 overs. Unbelievable scenes because of the atmosphere of the crowd as well, which is obviously what we all miss now is crowds at the matches and hopefully you know we'll be back to that sort of situation this summer if if all things go well yeah fingers crossed for martin thank you very much for your time today really appreciate it great no talking through your all. career to date and uh, all the best for the months ahead thank you very much enjoyed it and um yeah go well thank you so neil kagram cricket love stories martin sagas thank you <laughs>